1878. Switzerland. They usually have a number on them for the, for the size, and they made them all different size. This is one of our older ones. That's like a fine brass. And they're all dusty and cobwebs because they've been hanging here under our, I suppose you could call it our breezeway between the milk house and the barn all winter. And when those cows get them on, they're all that dust is going to go away and they're going to get shined up nice just from being. So. These are my favorite. They're not big and they're very, the sound carries very far. To number four. So, when did your dad come here? Many years ago. In the early 1950s, he came here from Switzerland as an immigrant when he was 19 years old. And he worked for some farmers, several different farmers, and he got his citizenship after being here about seven and a half years and moved on to buy a farm and get married and raise his family. He came from St. Gallen. A canton in Switzerland. Kind of like a county, ain't it? Those, yes. those areas. Yeah. Um, what was he, there, 15 kids in his family? Yes, I believe so. So what was he like, the, more towards the younger ones maybe it was, yes. wasn't it? He wanted a farm and he saw opportunity here in America as the land of opportunity where he could buy his own farm and raise a family. So. And what was that, like a nine acre farm or something he came from? Yes. It was hectares there, but the, he, he said it was equivalent to nine acres. I remember that. And I could see how he'd come here because it was, this was the land opportunity. Everything was getting kind of crowded there back then already. Where stuff was expensive and a lot of people, a little bit of land. This is one of the bells he made. Now this is, uh, that's a length off of a gutter chain. And he even made the buckle. You can see where he welded it here. And I got, I'm trying to get this out. This, this ring here, I put that in there. That was for, that's to tie the cow's number on, or the tire in the barn when I had it on. Something heavy and big like this, we usually put on one of those, those really heavy Swiss cows or, one, or like a blue roan, something built a little more like a beef cow. I mean, they, that doesn't phase them nothing. I carry that around. It's kind of like a necklace. They're kind of proud to have their bells well, on. Well, I noticed that. They almost like get jealous if you put it on something else. And this one here, that was from your aunt? That was your we, godmother? Yes, we got that for a wedding gift and we've had it on a cow on our farm every year since. It's 30 years. I had to do a few repairs on it. And then I got again a place to tie her because otherwise in the st tie stall barn. And one time I remember this bell, the cow came home without it. Well, good thing I noticed that right away because then I knew kind of where they were in the pasture and I thought that's gonna be like looking for a needle in a haystack. I would have assumed they'd usually lose them in the woods, rubbing them on something or where the buckle would undo itself. And there it was, right on top of the hill, there was a log I had from a tree guy cleaned up but the log was still there she must have been rubbing on it and it was just draped over it like she took it off and just laid it there I found it as soon as I walked up I found it right away I thought well that was kind of that doesn't happen like that usually you hunt forever sometimes very rarely they lose them but we've had a few lose and then I found I had one where I found it with the bush hog it actually ended up damaging it but it mowing the pastures I mean so I do find it but anyway but yeah, they're all kind of different. That, this is another one her dad made and handcrafted. Our, yeah, and our and you can see almost how sharp, even where the belt hangs through. That's actually a sharp edge. You can almost yeah, you could cut yourself. There. Well, that's pretty old and worn now. Yeah, but that's similar to the well, then like like this one our son made and uh, I think the the shape length and then how thick the steel is the type of steel it is i think that all has to do with the type of sound it makes i kind of like these size too 
and there's actually a goat down there. I don't know if you can zoom in on that. It's an it's it's got a number three, 1996 Swiss made. And I noticed over there what they. Uh, so that's not an original belt on this. Belt. No, well this is a Swiss belt, but that's not. This is a nylon belt, and I these would would fall off easier because I think because they're so they're so relaxed, you know they. They're not, you don't have to fight them on. The ones you gotta fight on a little harder usually don't undo themselves, but it's nice to have a belt wide enough. So I think it does, it's a little more comfortable for them to wear if they're not a thinner belt. But, um, but yeah, so then the number rip presents the size of the bell. And I think this is from whatever Canton or whatever area, the blacksmith that was there in those areas. Cause we, when we were there, we have noticed that. And it's getting to be more just tradition more now. It's kind of like here where everything's changing a bit, but the, the government still encourages all the farmers to stick with the tradition, some of it for tourism purposes. That one has a really nice sound to it. These are my favorite. I like these. They trap that, that bell travels a long way. Those so are... there's a lot of different sounds from the different shapes and different thicknesses of the bells. Yep. So um, it kind of makes a musical tone when the cattle are out there all with their bells on, grazing in the pasture. But the cows are starting to be let out during the day, but until they stay out all day and all night and only come in for milking, the cows won't wear the bells because there's too much risk of them damaging them if they're in the stalls at night. See here you got a crack in that one and that's probably where it was in the manger someplace. We have a couple down in the shop there that need to get welded and I don't know that's some different type of metal some of them. It's some of those brass ones and uh, they won't make a sound because the crack doesn't allow it to ring. It's really interesting so that needs to be I think if they were even if they're cracked, they can be re-welded, you'll get the same sound again. And then the dongs, we've picked up dongs. That's like a replaceable part. I never realized that, but there was a, there's a, still a few of those old shops there that, um, yeah, we have a container of those dongs down there that we brought back with us. Besides, but I don't know, we must have what, maybe 50 of these already? We don't really put them on every cow necessarily, unless we're gonna do like a dairy breakfast or something a little more showy. They go on the heifers as well but, in but the pasture. The, but yeah, so like she's like you say, the the heifers and dry cows. It's mostly the pregnant stuff that doesn't have to come into the barn, you know, after they had their first calf. So even once, it kind of saves you because one time I had a cow missing. I must have brought her back from the back forty to she was getting close, but her date wasn't supposed to be yet, and she must have calved a couple days later, and she ended up. Well, I couldn't find her. I was driving all over and walking all over in the woods. It took me a long time. And finally, I could hear that bell sound, a ding, ding. And I thought, yep, down in there. And I went down in there in the middle of July and there was blackberry bushes and everything. It took me a while to even get down in there. She had a set of twins in there. And that explains why she calved earlier. I mean, we might have not found that cow for a week until she finally came home for water in the daytime or something where we just spotted her. The cows like to hide when they have their babies because they want to protect their babies. Yeah, I think that's the well, that's natural. It's not a something but it's more of nature. Of, uh, they can't stay hidden as long. Now this is supposed to be stainless steel, and a friend of ours gave us this. And I noticed it's getting a little rusty, so it's probably not as good a stainless as the real old stainless. But that's an American cow bell. I think somewhere out west they maybe got this from, but a little, little different again, you know, and uh, I think the dong in there might be a Swiss dong because the original dong maybe wore out. Pretty much all the all the dry cows and, and some of the larger heifers or the closer up heifers will get a bell. And then I kind of size them to the animal a little bit. Some of those bigger, more aggressive cows get the bigger bells and the so the bells have a practical use for us here on the farm and they also help us keep up with our Swiss heritage. And it's something that we can encourage our children to do 
to continue on with their Swiss heritage. It's something that um, on my side of the family, on my dad's side, uh, his farm, he always had cowbells on. He gave us some cowbells. We got cowbells for wedding gifts, as we said. And when we went on our honeymoon, we bought some more bells. And when we brought our children to meet their Swiss relatives, we purchased some too, let them pick out a couple each so that they would have something that they would feel was something that they could have for their future generations to come. And now our oldest, he has created some bells himself um farm farmer fabrication he says so that's really encouraging it's really to see neat that. that he he actually decided all on his own i want to do this because that was something his his grandpa's which he's gone now you know so he can't you know do it with him but that he would uh he you know he wanted to do it, so you know he's going to keep it up when we started out there was a, still a couple other farmers besides your dad that still did the bells that they had the Swiss background and that, but that's all gone. So that's just, this has become our trademark. I've used to sell heifers to this guy that was quite a ways away. He'd only come here once a year, and when I'd call him and take a minute, and then he'd go, you're that guy with those Swiss cowbells, right? And that was all it took for him to know who he was talking to. So then in the barn, it gets a little noisy during milking in the summer, so then when you're on the telephone, I mean, you can't eavesdrop on it. <laughs> they know that. It's never completely quiet, even when they chew their cud. So we can tell if a cow is just chewing her cud because the, the sound, the tone of the bell, is just, it's just barely grazing the side of it, or the dong, I mean, and then, when they're walking, when they're running, or when they're grazing. It's all kind of a different type of sound. And I've had it where, you know, we sleep with the bedroom window open a crack so we can, you know, it's kind of close to the pasture where they come home. And I could tell which cow came home. It was maybe a cow that came home looking for a calf, something that maybe calved a, you know, less than a week ago. So I could tell you which cow that was that walked by. It's kind of almost grows on you all this stuff. So now we're at the point we don't even hear it anymore. It's like living next to the interstate. You just, it's just a noise that's natural for us. And then the neat thing is in the neighbors, they'll, there's guys that are three, four or five miles from here over a couple hills in different valleys that talk about these, how they could hear the bells at night if the wind is just right or so. I think we even got a bell for this one. Yeah. No, she has a barrel. 